Okay, hey, well, welcome back. Um, so today the video is going to be pretty different from what I normally do. Uh, I um, uh, connected with a creator on TikTok and really enjoyed their content. So I reached out to them and hey, uh, we ended up having uh, a really nice uh, conversation. So hopefully you enjoy it. Um, our topics are uh, pronoun usage and uh, internal versus uh, external validation. So I hope you really enjoy it. Um, please, as you watch it, um, please approach everything with an open mind and um, hopefully maybe you'll learn something. But without uh, further ado, let's get into the video. Make sure that's working. Okay, should be good. Um, yeah, so hi. Um, we, I guess, originally connected via TikTok. Uh, so you have your, your channel or account there and I thought that uh, there was a video you did that I thought was really, really interesting where I think you were responding to someone else's video um, where they talked about like gender identity and they used the the parallel between like uh, cultural appropriation and as, a, as like a form of like a gender appropriation, which I had never heard anyone refer to it that way. And I thought like your response about um, internal and external validation was, was really good. Um, so you go ahead, um, I guess just kind of introduce yourself, talk about your, I guess, experiences or kind of what sparked you to, to make that video response. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of work around helping people work through trauma, helping people work through self-empowerment and things like that. I've gone undergone my own journey and there's a lot of complexities involved. Right. And, um, one of the things I've learned that are one of the more important skill sets to have is have that emotional resilience to have uncomfortable conversations with people. And we're in a society right now where we have to walk on eggshells because everything can be offensive in some way. And it really prevents these conversations from happening with an understanding lens, right? And when, when we can't have this conversation with people who take information, how they understand it, it prevents people from understanding with compassion. And so the video that you're referring to, uh, he used some of the bigger trigger words, right? Like appropriation, that's a dangerous word these days. True but it still has a definition and it still applies regardless of how we feel around shame, guilt, and embarrassment with it. It's still a valid discussion. Um, and that kind of led me into really understanding the, the other side of this conversation where it's like, okay, so if appropriation is a trigger word around, around taking in a negative way, well, is it though, or is it admiration? And there's that fine line between where we have that, that um, complexity with that word. Um, what a lot of people struggle with in terms of trauma, especially if you have validation trauma, is that you seek that validation in all kinds of ways. Most people don't have it enough on the inside, so they don't have the internal validation. Right. So they look externally, right? And that's where things come into place like, I need you to respect me the way I want. And with transgender people specifically, that can come down to, I, I want you to address me with my pronouns at a minimum, right? Sure. There's a lot, there's a whole spectrum there. <laughs> but the problem is, is, you know, when you force it upon people, you're one triggering a bias spectrum. So it's immediately going to be a defensive action. And then that just starts snowball effect into that whole understanding between two people. And, and that's yeah. where I really wanted to make that stance of if you have internal validation, <laughs> other people's ability to validate you is relevant, right? Because Right. The reality is, is you're going to walk the earth and there's going to be parts of you people aren't going to accept. That's a reality. Yeah. But when you force it and weaponize that against people, well, are you solving a problem or creating a problem? True. And that's I think, where I try to come these conversations with. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I think because I, I think in, in the video too, that you mentioned that um, a lot of the, the attitude for it is like, hey, you have to respect my pronouns, like, or else. There's that, like, that extra bit in there. Um and I think you're right. It's similar to uh, what people will say where it's like, you know, put your oxygen mask on before you help the person next to you. It's like you, uh, as an individual, you have to come to terms kind of like with your understanding of who you are. And then you can kind of go out into the world and say like, okay, I'm comfortable with who I am and I understand what I'm about. And now here's kind of like what I need from other people. Um, there was Absolutely. actually, there was a great web comic I saw uh, probably like four or five years ago, and it kind of reminded me as, as we we're talking about this, and I, if I can find it, I, I'll put a, an image of it up, but um, it was two people that were, were talking in the comic. There was one 
uh, was a, I think, a feminist activist, and the other person was a, a transgender individual, uh, male to female. And the the activist is looking at the transgender individual, getting ready. They're they're getting dressed, I think, like doing makeup or whatever. And they say to them, like, "Oh, why are you doing that? Like, that's you know, you're you're dressing for the male gaze and all of those usual things." And then the response from the transgender person was like, well, hey, I'm, I'm doing this because like this is kind of like how I survive in society because there's this expectation that's set up and I don't want to be like, uh, say, targeted or, or picked out in public for that. So this is what I have to do. Like you may not like it and that might not fit like your worldview, but you have to understand that that's kind of how I have to live and survive because there's like exp these expectations. Uh, and I think, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so that that that's the really slippery slope of this conversation, right? So mm -hmm. when we look at a lens of adaptation and and survival and trauma, right? Because the reality is is that up to this point of transition, there's likely trauma, whatever that may look like, right? And there's a lot of social constructs in place. And so one side of this conversation that it's complex and it's led by a lot of very passionate voices is the deconstructing of the social constructs, right? So oh, yeah. I, I shouldn't have to be afraid to go out had the, the gender roles not been there to begin with, right? And that's where you get into the, the non-binary realm and the gender fluidity realm. Mm -hmm. And yes, when you're looking at what the cause of problem is that when you say it out loud, it makes sense. But the path to go from here to there is where we're running into the resistance. And it's perfectly valid, right? So when we think about constructs, social constructs, it takes a ridiculous amount of time to establish, right? Oh, sure. Hundreds, hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. And when you think about evolution, the biggest evolutions in our cultures happened, what, 25, 50, 100, 150 years. Yeah. It takes significant time. Well, social media does what? It makes us think that we can immediately attain our dreams and goals because on our seven inch screen, we can manipulate it any way we want. Yeah. Well, where I think the problem is, is that we are trying to deconstruct social constructs, right? Internet's only been around, what, 25 years? Social media? Even we're less, trying yeah. to Right. And we're trying to deconstruct these constructs faster than we've socially evolved to be able to handle it. And that's where this real passion comes from, right? There's this very valid lens of let's get rid of these constructs. I want to do that today. Like I'm from a generation where I can do it today. Right. Then there's the real world where mm -hmm. it takes people time. It takes generations to unlearn big things. Oh, of course. And I think and that's it's, why I, it's kind of wild ahead. to like, I was having this conversation with my mother the other day and it's like, you, when you take somebody who is currently like, you know, 50, 60 years old and they have the past you know, 50, 60 years of their life where these very stereotypical gender roles have always been fulfilled. Um, you know, like I look at like my mother, her, her father, you know, my grandfather worked two jobs and because he, it was part of his, I guess, upbringing that like his wife was never going to work. It was like, that's not your role, you know? So we're, we're expecting people who've come from that and grew up with that. Now all of a sudden overnight, we want them to just adopt these things wholesale and like nothing happened. And it's like, well, you're, you're talking to people who come from an era in like the forties and fifties where like men, you know, gay men were still very much in the closet, getting married, having whole families because it's just, that was, the world was a completely different place then. Um, and then you're, but you're, yeah, it's like, you're expecting these same people to just sort of adopt all of these new concepts for them. And uh, whereas they have a lot of years sort of like invested in the system, so to speak. Well, and they have their own, they have their own stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's got a story. And when it comes to uncomfortability, that, that's where we really struggle as a culture. We have a very big fear of uncomfortability mm -hmm. because in a, in a world of convenience, right? Our stress response system is relied on safety. And in a world of convenience, a lot of us associate discomfort with safety. And so if something's uncomfortable, such as somebody representing in a way that, that you don't understand, you're going to have your stress response system triggered and fight, flight, or freeze is going to kick in. And this is where a lot of the aggression comes from and the, and the bullying and the teasing and the way worse things from a political sure. concept, right? Oh, yeah. And people's unawareness of this is where the energy is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's a really unfortunate thing that we dismiss uncomfortability. When we live in that, it's amazing. 
But that is a culture shift that in itself will take 150 years, multiple lifetimes of, of understanding vulnerability, of understanding a new way of thinking. And we just started exploring that at a big level with a very diverse world with lots of different backgrounds 25 years ago. Yeah, but definitely. And I think that like uh, more along those lines too, like there's a lot of different things kind of all happening at the same time. And we talked about someone like... Um, like abolishing like gender norms and stuff like that i think there's definitely especially when you talk about things people online like twitter and all that kind of stuff like there is i think a large group of people who i guess they call themselves like gender abolitionists right they don't think there should be any definition man woman everything between just get rid of it who cares and that's awesome but like we're saying like that would take that's gonna take like a hundred years before people really could can sort of adopt that idea but then we have people today who are going through a lot of struggles and the whole idea of abolishing gender really isn't helping them because they're trying to fit in and exist in society as it is today. Um, and I think there's, so it's like this push and pull of, there are people who are, you know, trying to explore their identity and exist as, as the world is today. And you have people on the other end saying like, well, why do you even care? Because gender is just this complete made up thing anyway, we should just do away with it all together. And they're like, well, that's not helping because the majority of people don't, don't agree with that. I think the, the best explanation I heard of it, I, I wish I remembered the author, but they were talking how there's, it's probably a little bit of both. Like somebody's gender is most likely like half socially constructed and half sort of like the way that you're born. Um, Cause I know I've read of studies where they'll take um, like young babies born female and, and other babies born male. And um, they put them in a room with like, I think, like building blocks and then like uh, picture books, or whatever. And the, the female children tend to go towards the picture books and, you know, men tend to go towards the blocks. Uh, and that's just, these are just like newborns, like young kids or whatever, you know, so they're not really heavily really that ingrained yet. So there's probably some of it that is like you're born with and other ones that is just kind of made up, right? Um, but it's the joining of those two that when you get people who are trying to identify or kind of exist, it's like you have to find that that happy balance between those two things. Well, and and this is where, this is where empowerment is really the conversation that isn't had, right? Mm -hmm. So where a lot of the, the gender alignments and the gender abolitionist lens is coming from is like, okay, well, I like this feminine thing, even though I'm masculine. However, I can't just cross that lane, <laughs> right? There's too many constructs in place. And so I can either A, fully adapt into that so I can be accepted into that group, but I'll be alienated from my original group. Mm -hmm. And I will likely be alienated from my other group. And that's where the gender abolitionists, I think motivation really comes from is the reality is we're going to get alienated from both groups. It doesn't matter. So the simplest solution, right? Just like our seven inch screens, let's just swipe it away right. and, we'll, and let's get, let's get rid of it all together. And from that lens, from someone who's experienced a lot of trauma and that the easiest solution is disassociation or to do the flight response. Sure. That's a solution for you. However, that is not a solution for the other people who would be impacting by deconstructing the social constructs, deconstructing the language, doing enough wordplay to where you can gaslight people into, into thinking that the way they understand life and that their lived experiences are invalid, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 just, it, it doesn't make sense to go, my lens of here's why the construct should exist is valid, but your lens of this is how you've always known it is invalid. And that's where the, the fight comes from. Oh, definitely. And I think too, like well, something as I was kind of like thinking about um, this conversation throughout the week, one of the things that I, I realized, I was like, you know, we let, we let a lot of people sort of control the conversation when it really like you're kind of like we're saying, there's a lot of nuance to it, right? Like somebody's experience is just as valid as somebody else's. And it's sort of, you know, where are you kind of meeting in the middle? But we always kind of fall back on like, um, folks like the the bench pair types or whatever are, are famous for saying like well when you ask them about gender they're like well a man's a man a woman's a woman you know and like that's kind of like this simple dumb response and we find that we end up responding to that because that's what people like latch on to because they like little tiny bite-sized phrases and it's like well no there's way more to it than that and like it's not as simple as just you know a and b and there's all these things like we're talking about like social constructs and your um your history and whatever and that the, like your lived experience that's all going to affect different people differently. And we can't just boil it down to like, well, man's a man, a woman's a woman, you know, and that uh, I think the conversations as a whole would probably be better served if whenever we come across something like that, we just adopt the, 
um, the method of kind of just ignore it because it just doesn't really help anyone. And I think people get too like they get too stuck on like the dissidents, like people who go against you. And it's like, okay, sometimes it's just better to ignore them because they're getting you hung up on these these issues that we're trying to move past. And it's like, well, if we just ignore them and just move past it, then we don't have to get hung up on these like tiny uh, or these other personalities that they're just sort of detracting from things as a whole. Yeah, <clears throat> and a lot of that, um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of that, that fight can come from tribe thinking, mm -hmm. right? So, so there is reality to our species. We're biologically wired to do a lot of things. Survival mechanisms is one of those, and there's a whole spectrum there. But we do tribe up. We find safety in, in numbers. We find comfort and safety. And so it makes sense from a survival standpoint for some people to go, well, all right, well, I'm going to be safer. I'm comfortable over here, so I'm going to be safer over here, so I'm going to line over here. And if I can convince more people to be over here with me, I'm going to be safe. And oh, shoot, these people, they don't agree with me. This is unsafe. This is clearly unsafe. And so now we're going to tribe up and we're going to start pinning groups against each other and gatekeeping and all of that nonsense. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult thing to approach because you're fighting what we're biologically wired to do while arguing that what we're biologically wired to do doesn't exist. Right? You're, you're literally reinforcing a point that you're trying to argue. Right, right. And, and, and avoiding that hard truth and deconstructing how we understand things like biology today, it, it paints a very different picture from people who are proud of how they were born, who are empowered by being born a man and being a masculine man or a woman and finding the power in womanhood, mm -hmm. right? And, and trying to shift that conversation from like, shame on you and your pride because I don't have enough pride for myself and what I am choosing to do. One of the solutions I approach trans people with is, okay, so men, women, those are two buckets and we're at a, we're a resource-based culture. And so let's, let's fit in one of those buckets. Well, if we don't fit in those buckets, well, now what? We're alienated. We're not tribed up. And this is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Aren't we though? Because there's nothing wrong with creating another tribe. You don't have to fit into each tribe. Now, is that going to be hard and comfortable work? Is it going to require a lot of rejection from people, again, 50 to 100 to 150 years to really establish a change like that. And that's where we are in this moment in time, I think, is this, this shift over, okay, well, we, we understand that there's going to be three choices or more. Gender abolitionists are creating who knows what other avenues, right? Sure. But there's nothing wrong with empowering ourselves to seek to understand that either. Oh, of course. I think that's like a, a very, I mean, I, I think just understanding yourself is just this incredible, like ongoing process. I mean, I know for me specifically, I had a weird moment. I want to call it weird, but a couple of years ago, a friend of mine went to a, a convention and he was telling me about it afterward and said like, oh, you know, they had name tags you could get and you could put your pronouns like on your name tag. And I was like, well, that's cool. That probably helped people out. And at the time I was like, you know, what I really care. And I realized that like, Sure, I identify as a cisgendered straight man, but like for me personally, if someone used a different pronoun to refer to me, like I, I probably wouldn't care. And I was like, huh, I guess that's like the idea of, I guess, I don't want to say confronting your privilege, but looking at it as like that I'm from someone who's like really never had that issue before. So for me, it's like, yeah, I don't really care. You can say whatever you want. It's really not going to affect me at the end of the day. Um, and that's sort of where I kind of adopted the um, the posture of like, whenever one of these issues comes up, I kind of just listen to what other people are saying and see what their experience is and go, okay, cool. That's something. Sure. I can help you out. I'll refer you however you want me to refer you. It doesn't really matter because for me, like, it's not really, it's not really an issue. So I don't have to have that, like, I don't have that, like, skin in the game, so to speak. Um, and at least that's, like I said, like, kind of like why I wanted to have this conversation here today is because, like, you have a very different perspective. It was a lot different, more different than mine. I figure, hey, if there's any like the more perspectives I can get, then like the better it is overall. Well, and that's what I think is the path to go from here to there. It is exposure. The reality is, is most people don't have direct exposure to a transgender person. Mm -hmm. And the exposure they do have is a fed experience from somebody else. And that's where you get these extreme stories, right? These, these stories about predators or these stories about agendas, right? Right, right. When you meet most 
trans people who've done the work on themselves, who've really worked on the empowerment and the self-love and compassion, there's actually more of those than there are more of these radical voices who are using social media as a coping mechanism and they're mm -hmm. using unhealthy methods to communicate what to them is abundantly obvious, but what to everyone else basically just looks like an attack. So yeah. seeking to expose people to the different spectrum of the transgender community, that's going to be a path to get us somewhere different, better or worse. I don't know, <laughs> but at least somewhere different, right? Sure. Well, yeah, I think definitely like the, probably one of the, the best things I've ever experienced has ever had is just the more people that you know, it's, it's much easier to sympathize with someone or have empathy for them if you've actually met someone who fits into that category or someone who has had that experience. Um, and then you, you just learn more about the person and, and how like they go through life. Cause I think you're saying like, true, it's a, a filtered experience. Like, especially if you spend a lot of time on say like Twitter or whatever, uh, you're getting an extremely narrow view of, of one person's experience. And like, unfortunately the expression of the squeaky wheel getting the oil, uh, the most vocal individuals are, those are the experiences that kind of like rise to the top that we all hear about when that may not be the most common experience for someone, or that may not be um, a way that the majority of say trans people have experienced it. It's just this one person, they have a lot of, a lot of followers, a very, you know, a very loud presence, and they're able to kind of push through their story. Uh, and so if you're an outsider or someone who has never met anyone who's transgender and it's the only experience you have, you're looking at them and going, my God, this person's gotta be crazy. You know, because it's just one single experience. So you want to expose yourself to as much of it as possible and, and then go from there and say, okay, well, I've met like four or five people. They kind of fit this one way. And I've met about maybe seven or eight and they fit a different way. And it's like, okay, I see where it's a different experience for everyone. Because it's, it's like anything in life, right? Like we could both do the exact same task and it'd be a completely different experience for both of us, regardless of, you know, because we all have different experiences. And I think that it's much better to... They were saying, hear all of these different experiences rather than just one person. And you get this like really skewed perspective of what actually the case is. Absolutely. And, you know, that applies to the transgender community as well. When they only allow um, people who affirm them, when they only allow one type of conversation, and that's you have to accept me, you, you you don't see your impact on other communities. Um, one of the really heated conversations is, is feminism, especially with trans women, right? Mm -hmm. So feminism is about protecting women's rights. Well, let's deconstruct language, deconstruct social constructs and trans women are women. But to feminists who many of that movement have significant trauma around biological males, that's triggering for them. It's triggering to even uh, approach that concept, right? Right. And when the trans community goes, no, <laughs> we have to be included because that social constructs breakdown. Like I'm ready for it. And I know you're not ready for it. And we're just going to ignore things that we understand about biology and hard truths. It's, it's a very, it's a very tricky place to not listen yeah. to your impact on other people. And I think that's where a really painful part of the hard truths is, is the term, right, TERF, trans extreme or trans exclusion, radical feminist. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think that's a term that applies. Feminism applies to biological women. Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a huge difference between women's rights and trans rights because a lot of additional language and contingencies are required for trans rights right. in a good way, in a safe way. But they can't yeah. get past the need for the affirmation. They can't get past the, the language piece and, and people's lived experiences around biology and trauma and, and PTSD. And it's, it's, a, it's a really dangerous place to isolate from both sides of the equation. Sure. Like I said, because you were saying, like, if you don't fit into column A or if I want to go to column A, well, I'm going to, I risk losing my acceptance from column B and I also might not be accepted in column A and you're just kind of stuck in the middle. There was actually, you know, we're talking about TikTok. There was a, a TikTok video I, I came across and it was, it was so interesting talking about like uncomfortable conversations. Um, this woman was, was sharing a story of where she was at a party and it was like her, another cisgendered female friend of hers and a transgender friend of theirs who um, transitioned uh, female to male. And the, uh, the one cisgendered woman was going off, I guess maybe she had a bad experience on a date or whatever, and she was being very negative talking about how like men are horrible and whatever. And the um, transgender individual was like, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? Like, are you including me in this? Like, and, like, and she then 
backpedaled and was like, well, no, like you kind of know the experience is different. And he, like, he's like, what are you talking about? Like we, you know, it's, it's the, the accepted narrative is trans men are men. So like, if you're going to start talking about uh, how you don't, you know, um, like toxic masculinity or whatever, like this almost by default applies to, to a trans man. Uh, and then it's very, it gets very weird and uncomfortable when you say, well, you've had a different experience. It's not the same. And it's like, well, then you have to start adding a lot of caveats in there because if you're going to adopt the, if you're going to hard lie and take that, that, you know, you know, trans women are women and trans men are men and you're not going to, and there's no deviation allowed from that, then you have to start getting into these uncomfortable conversations. And it's like, well, if you're going to talk about things like toxic masculinity and all that, well, that kind of now applies to trans men if you're of that, um, of that mindset. I, yeah, that, that's a conversation I have with people who are understanding those complex emotions with their gender identity. It's like, okay, so at the end of the day, it's about gender dysphoria. You feel different on your inside and you wanna be that on the outside. However, making big changes, right? Such as medically transitioning. Mm -hmm. One, you're committing to potentially irreversible things. But two, you're also accepting what comes with that side of the conversation, right? There's a whole spectrum of, of um, cisgendered traits that people want and don't want as well. And so, yeah, in your case of trans men, okay, you want to identify as men. Well, they're the least popular of the groups right now, right? And that's a reality. And, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and even with um, you know people who medically transition before doing their emotional work, many of them solve gender dysphoria in a different way. Over time, they understand that, you know, my acceptance of myself and my validation of myself was what I was missing from day one. And I didn't have to medically transition. And, and that's where a lot of heat comes with the detransitioners as well, is mm -hmm. they solved their gender dysphoria over time with just experiencing different lifestyles, experiencing a whole bunch of things. But they went through medical transition, which means they had to medically untransition. And I think the transgender community takes that as a very, you know, hostile approach, <laughs> just like cisgender people of taking away the language of biological sex, transgender people take detransitioners as it's invalidating our experience. It's like, right. well, no, they solved the same problem you're trying to solve for, but they solved it through emotions, through hard work on themselves, empowerment, self-love. There's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't invalidate anything about you. Right. But that experience cannot be shut down because... The reality is, is that many, there's a high population of people identifying as transgender mm -hmm. and they're taking the extremes to do it, right? So I'm going to do physical things before doing the emotional things. If I do the physical things, I don't have to work on the emotional things. It's just going to solve itself. Well, then they do it and they have buyer's remorse. Right. They go, it didn't do what I wanted. And then they continue to struggle. They perpetuate a cycle of pain. Yeah. Versus having an honest conversation around understanding, uh, not taking extremes to play in the gender roles right yeah well i think um it gets i think that one of the things is that with a lot of the, the conversation especially around like the lgbt community as a whole um we talk about everyone's experience being different and everyone's experience being valid but i think sometimes it's like everything's experience is valid until i think you're invalidating me and then I don't want to accept what you had. So like we were saying with people who, who detransition, I actually, I had a conversation with someone actually a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was, it was online and, and they were talking about like their, um, their experience with gender and how like they didn't like the idea of like medically transitioning because for them, they thought they wanted to transition. They did, I guess, like, I guess they just changed like the way they dress and their appearance. Um, and then years later realized that that wasn't for them. That really wasn't solving their problem. So they were like, oh, if I had medically transitioned, like I'd be in a really rough spot because I didn't want that. And, and I was like, okay. And like the more I talked to them, I realized like this person was just pretty lost. They had kind of went through a lot of different things. And I was like, okay, well, I'm glad you're in a place now that you're, you know, kind of more understanding of yourself. But like, I can understand where that person was coming from, like, because they realized like, hey, if I made this really big decision, I'd be really unhappy with myself because it ended up not being what I needed. And I think there's a lot of, uh, sort of everyone this all or nothing where like oh you identify as transgender well hey you better get all the the hormones the surgeries we gotta make sure you get access to all this stuff because this is everything you need and yeah some people do need that but 
there's probably a good number of people that don't or who if they did go through all of that probably wouldn't be a good choice for them and like we're saying kind of like buyer's remorse if you go ahead and make these huge changes and then realize like hey maybe this isn't for me this isn't really what i what i wanted or isn't really helping me now you're like well now not only do i have to come to terms with hey everything i've worked for has not worked out now i also have to worry about going through surgery or anything again to undo all that stuff that i had done and I got to imagine that that adds a whole nother level of, of stress and anxiety to the whole process. Well, on top of, um, you know, the gatekeeping within the LGBTQ community, right? The pressures, mm -hmm. the binary thinking, it's all or none. You're with me or against me. It, it's, it's always amazing to me how we say there's a spectrum around this until it's uncomfortable and then it's binary, Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I think people really struggle with that concept, especially online. And, and I think it just has to do with, I'm able to swipe out of this, right? I either want this, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to swipe out of it, I don't. And there's not a spectrum understanding or a spectrum acceptance. And, and self-victimization is, it's real <laughs> and, it's, and it's rampant, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, many people, I think, really struggle with if I, if I get the validation I need, that means I have to be extreme. That means I have to have the binary thinking. That means I have to weaponize people's emotions to get that. And is that a terrible, awful, toxic trait? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there a core reason behind it due to trauma, whether it's validation or physical or who knows what? Also part of the conversation. We need to really think about how our mental health support system is having this conversation. And there are oh, yeah. more than one way to solve trauma there's more than one way to solve gender dysphoria Definitely. and it's okay that there's more than one way we need mm -hmm. to get out of the binary thinking yeah well i think i, I think a lot of one of the things that i've always my kind of my general life philosophy is i think that one-on-one -on -one, people are very reasonable um so you don't have to uh explain things to them in like extreme manners people i think are very capable of understanding nuance and and the differences so if you're if you're someone who's worried about it and say, well, oh, well, I have to be the most extreme version of this because people won't understand me. It's like, yeah, sure, maybe a group of people might not understand you because, you know, we, we felt like group think and all that kind of stuff. But like, if you're just having a conversation with somebody and you need to, you know, and it takes you half an hour to explain to them your gender identity, like, yeah, they're probably going to understand what you're saying, you know, uh, and they probably also want to understand you. Because again, like, I think most people are pretty reasonable and, and don't, like if you if you asked a bunch of people and said, "Hey, do you want to make someone feel uncomfortable?" Most people would probably say no, right? Because like we we tend to treat people the way that we kind of perceive ourselves. So like we're talking about discomfort. It's like I think when a lot of times with these conversations, people do feel uncomfortable, and then you said that like fight or flight response takes over. Where if I feel like I'm being attacked, it's like when really I'm just genuinely curious about your life, or I'm trying to understand what you're saying, and maybe I don't understand everything that you're saying, and I need it to be explained. Um, now I can understand that that conversation can become very exhausting sometimes if every new person you meet, you have to have the same conversation with them and it's the same questions, this and that over and over. I can understand it very, very exhausting. Um, but it kind of just goes, sometimes I think a lot of it goes to the territory. You have to say, Hey, I, this is the way I've chosen to live life and the things I have to do. And I have to understand like the, all the stuff that kind of comes with it. Um, because I know a lot of the conversation now revolves around like um, like the neo pronouns, where it's these different words that people really aren't used to. And um, like I, I just had the the they them conversation with my mother, and, and I'm like, okay, like she kind of gets it. And now I'm like, I don't even think I could start talking about neo pronouns. I don't think she'd even understand that. Like that because she's just starting to get this concept of like the they them stuff. Um, so I'm like, all right, let's leave it there. Let's let's stay there. I think we made good progress. Like this is this is fine, but. Uh, it gets it gets difficult. Um, I kind of understand where it's a, a very uncomfortable conversation. Um, so I guess that's the, the one question I I had, had um, as someone you said who works with um, people getting through trauma and stuff like that. When it comes to like the pronoun conversation, I guess if you have any good advice for like kind of how that conversation happens, because again, like I said, I think most people are reasonable and they don't want to make somebody embarrassed or uncomfortable. It's like you want to ask, but like. Well, how do I go about this in like a manner where I'm not making them feel like alienated, but I'm also like being respectful to them? Uh, yeah. So th this is a whole spectrum as well. Um, the, the best advice that I try to give people is understand your intent and try to understand the other person's intent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, I get misgendered frequently enough, right? I have a deeper voice and there's many trans transgender 
trans women who have even more deeper voices. And so mm-hmm. in, a, in a random passerby in your, in your robotic life, you hear this voice behind you and you immediately go, oh, that's, that's going to be a sir. And you turn around and they're dressed differently and, and automatically it's uncomfortable. And this is where, you know, charisma and a couple of personality skills really come into place. And, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. You can do it very, as a matter of factly, probably not going to work for most people who are already in an uncomfortable situation. Or you can add some sort of context to it. Like, I'm a gal, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. And even then it probably isn't going to be accepted. You're going to get a confused look. But that impression you make on that person is going to teach them the lesson for the next person. True. And that's the responsibility I place on people who want to start using things that don't align 100% with our social constructs, such as the, the new pronouns. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, so if you're going to do that, that's fine. And you can teach as many people across the earth as you walk, walk up to them as you want but you're going to have to understand the nuances behind that and not weaponize that against them. And to your point, can it get exhausting if you're going to do that? Yep. And that's the hard truth of emotional resilience and working through that, that pain and that trauma. If you can't commit to doing it in a way that is constructive and actually does get you to your end goal Mm -hmm. with the people around you, maybe you should rethink how you're doing it, whether it's, whether you should do it. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Like if you're, if you're going to be that person's person's first interaction, um, sort of setting that example so that like the next person that they interact with, they already have that good experience and can call back to that. And it's sort of a, like, I, I, like, yeah, they say it's gotta be exhausting, but at the same time, like you have to think of the benefit for the other people down the road. Like, okay, if I have a really positive interaction with this person and I get them to understand something and then they become more accepting or, or better about it, now the next person they run into is is going to have a better experience. Um, and I guess it's like you have to think of that like delayed gratification of like, I may never meet the next person that they talk to, but if if like my interaction with them causes them to be a better person, then like that's like the greater good, so to speak, right? Well, and that comes down to a lack of understanding where people are in their, in their journeys as well. So a couple of the support groups I run are, have a lot of non-binary folk mm-hmm. and, and with these different pronouns that are all across the board and there's always a long justified explanation behind it back in 15th century english you know this author would use this and so it's been used before sure but that's not how we learned english in public education system in the past couple years right right um and 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 that's a a mental process people like to go to is well it used to happen once and it should happen Okay, but we're denying reality and working through trauma is accepting reality. And that's why that work is very, very important. You can say all the shoulds and used tos and can be's all you want, but at the end of the day, in the moment, a reality is a reality. And trying to convince people and gaslight people into thinking reality isn't their own reality. You're not solving a problem. You're making another one. Yeah. I, I often like the example I use when, because we're talking about like, oh, in like, you know, some historical doc or whatever, like. I liken that to, you know, it's it's kind of like if you're using a word and I like not using the common definition of a word, it's like, well, yeah, that, that's like some fifth page of Google result, you know, that you're using. And it's like, it's sort of instead of educating the person, I think sometimes there's this antagonistic response where, you know, you, I don't understand what you're saying. And you're like, wait, you, you don't go to the regularly go to the fifth page of Google and know that that's another thing. It's like, no, I don't do that because most people aren't going to have the time for that really, you know? And it's sort of it. It creates like a trap sometimes where you, if you knowingly are using or doing something that you know, this is some like fifth page and beyond of, of Google result and somebody, you know, people are going to come at you or, or not going to understand it because you're like, oh, no one's going to go that far into the results. No one knows. Uh, now I can kind of got you on that one and be like, oh, you didn't know that this was used in the 15th century, like English literature. God, what an idiot over here. Like, you know, and it's like, well, no, because people aren't going to expect that. And like, you had to also go hunting for that too. Like, it wasn't just something that you intuitively knew. Well, yeah. Mm, yeah. That Google conversation, that's one of those tough ones for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I get when we talk about social construction and, and social adjustment that we go, I'm not Google. I shouldn't be expected to do that. Mm. Sure. That is a fair statement. And there's a lot of nuances to that. And it applies to a lot of different characters. 
that sending someone to Google can do significantly more damage. Oh, sure. Because we, the words we use, how the search results we find, the algorithms that drive whichever polarized part of the conversation. And so that's how I approach it is they may have questions and those questions may be offensive to some people. I can deal with offensive, but at least I'm giving them a more honest and direct answer in a comfortable area. So they're not going to Google and getting something significantly worse. Oh, sure. And, if, I, and many people struggle with that concept. I'm yeah. not Google. Well, right, you, but right. you do have a responsibility if you're going to represent the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, um, a friend of mine who's Muslim. And I'll ask him, because we're very, very good friends. So I ask him questions all the time. Because um, he's, he, you know, is, um, I wouldn't say strictly follows, but he's he adheres to it pretty closely. And I asked him one time, I was like, hey, does it ever get bothersome like I ask all these questions? And he was, no, please. I'd much rather you ask me than you go to some godforsaken, like insane website that you're going to get results for and, and see like the absolute craziest interpretation of it. Like I'd rather you ask like me, an actual real practicing Muslim. Um, and I think it does, yeah, like you want to just go to, you know, to Google and be well informed, but at the same time, like you don't really, a lot of times you don't know where those answers are coming from and sort of the motive of the person writing the piece about it or whatever. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, sometimes the responsibility does fall on you, the, the real actual person in front of them to answer those questions. But I think it's, it should be a good thing. Like, I feel like if you approach it as like, I'm excited to tell you about this because it's, here's a chance for somebody else to learn and understand um it should, i think is, is a pretty good approach to have to that um because you want to be that positive interaction because then that person now has that positive to go you know going forward yes yes and that's the empowerment thing right and mm -hmm. being enough for yourself and the internal validation so one i love myself i'm enough for myself and that's contagious <laughs> oh so for sure hate but self-love is contagious and and when people see a well-rounded person who can compose themselves in a way that allows for uncomfortable learning. That is also contagious and it does spread. Mm -hmm. I run into people all the time who've never met someone like me. And is it weird? Is yeah. I'm sorry, your, your audio cut out on my end for like two seconds. Um, okay. So I don't know if you want to, you don't have to say the whole thing again, but I guess just give the gist of maybe the Where past like stop? 10 seconds. Um, where did it stop? Uh, you were talking about uh, like the uncomfortable conversation and how you, you said, I think the last thing you said was like, oh, are they weird? Am I weird? Yeah, I definitely yep. am. And that kind of cut off after that. Yep. So if we're going to be weird together and have this uncomfortable growing moment together. Oh, no, it cut out again. Actually, you're going to heal a part of them that they didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we all struggle with uncomfortability, but the more exposure we have that in soft, vulnerable spaces, we're going to build it with each other. And I approach that with everybody I meet 98% of the time. It works out really well. Are there still going to be people who are just going to be hell bent on their, their thinking? Sure. Yeah, of course. But I'm not going to focus on them. I don't need to. <laughs> you can just ignore them. You absolutely can. I don't yeah. need to have the whole world be on my side. I just need people who are going to be on my side met at their level. Exactly. Um, well, I don't have anything else. I think that's everything um, that I was looking to talk about. If there's anything more you want to add, please uh, feel free. No, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, these conversations around meeting in the middle and understanding with each other that's going to be a much better path going forward than trying to find ways we don't align. So I really appreciate the time. Great. No problem. Okay.